In India, 1.3 billion people have been told to stay home. But what if home looks like this? Could lockdown be more dangerous than the virus? For weeks now, the Indian government has insisted these people just don't exist. They're the hordes of workers from big cities whose bosses often give them somewhere to live. Now they're unemployed and desperate to return to their villages. We want to pretend that this isn't happening. And we want to forget that we're now entering the fifth week of the lockdown. And I'm going to try and talk to some of the women here they walk really fast. Didi, aapka naam? Baka Dutt is one of India's most famous journalists. She's been working with me so we can tell you this story together. Aapka naam, bhaiya? Rahul. Rahul, kitne din se chal rahi hai? Aao, chalte rahe, chalte rahe, aapko nahi rokhenge. Pandra din ho gaya hamen. Pandra din? Haan. Ab wahi kya te rahe, kaana pina pita nahi de rahe thi sarkar. Is liye ab paise pina nahi de, am aage, ab am kya kare? लेकिन कोरोना का तो आपने सुना होगा कि अभी हिलना ठीक नहीं है कोरोना का तो सुना था अब लेकिन अब क्या करें वहाँ पे तो उधर पड़े पड़े क्या करते हैं भूखे मरते हैं इसलिए आ गए हम पैदल पैदल और अभी और कितना किलोमीटर चलना है अभी 200 किलोमीटर और चलना है 200 किलोमीटर और हाँ और जहाँ आप काम क्या करते थे जहाँ थे हम जीरा तोड़ देते तो जीरा जो तोड़ते थे आपको क्या तनख्वाह देना बंद हो गया था हाँ तनख्वाह बंद देना हो गया था वो Raul and his family have no choice but to return to their rural homes on foot after the state suddenly suspended all public transport. As the snap shutdown was announced, Barker Dutt and her team set out to explore India's empty expressways. So they are carrying their life's belongings. They're obviously much fitter than I am because they're able to walk faster, they're able to walk longer. And they will walk like this for 10 days if needed, they say. And let's try and talk to some of the children up ahead, if we can get the camera to move up ahead to some of the very, very young children. Aapka naam? Aapka naam? Varsha. Varsha? Mera naam Barkha hai. To humare naam ka same meaning hai. Yeah. Kya umar hai aapki? Aao chalo. Kya umar hai? Pata nahi. Pata nahi? Aa. Acha, aisa itne din kaise chalogi? How many days will you go? We'll go. What will you do for eating? We'll go for roti. Up to 90% of Indians work in the informal economy. They earn around $4 a day. Many of them are migrant workers. They move to the city chasing odd jobs that pay a daily wage. They've got no security, no legal protections, and are vulnerable to poverty and starvation. Calling them migrant workers is ironic because they're all Indian born and raised. But in a country where the class divide is gargantuan, they may as well be from another place. With Australia's vast spaces, small population, and our wealth, it's not hard to practice social distancing here. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, I can hear you now, that's terrific. So, Barker, is the story you're telling now in India the one you thought you would be recounting when you first hit the streets at the beginning of this crisis? Not really, am I? We thought that our focus in terms of reporting would be much more centred around the coronavirus itself, patients grappling with it, what was happening in the hospitals. We have 45 million Indians who work as migrant workers. In other words, they migrate from the village, which is their home, uh, and come to the big city to look for work. And what we found was that when the Prime Minister, um, Narendra Modi, first announced the lockdown, you had millions of Indians, hundreds of thousands sometimes at one go, just fleeing the cities. This
This was the chaos that followed the decision to impose the biggest shutdown in the world. An announcement by PM Narendra Modi at 8pm on the 24th of March gave more than 1.3 billion people just four hours to lock themselves indoors. As people attempted to flee the cities, episodes of police brutality began to appear on social media. Some local authorities even sprayed migrant workers with disinfectant. The government says there was no choice but to shut the country down quickly. You had trains packed with migrants trying to go home, and which is completely understandable. But they would have taken the coronavirus back to rural areas that were least equipped to, to dealing with a pandemic of this magnitude. And it would have led to, a, potentially have led to a catastrophic uh, uh, outcome. Two weeks later, when the lockdown was extended, it happened again. Authorities used canes to force people away from a Mumbai train station. The scenes we saw at the train station gives an impression that migrant workers are almost the enemy to be battled rather than looked after. The narrative has been created that uh, the poor are not... Uh, ready to go into a lockdown and they are jeopardising the lives of the civil society. People are left to fend for themselves and you find migrant labour, which is actually creating wealth for Mumbai, are thrown under the bus. Mumbai is India's richest city. Home to more than 20 million, the streets usually teem with life. No one can remember it looking like this before. The main square and the financial district hide one of the biggest slums on earth. Dharavi. It's also one of the country's COVID-19 hotspots. 1,000 people here are infected. At least 56 have died. This city wouldn't function without the people who live here. Dharavi is home to many of the people who work in Mumbai's garment industry. Akram Shah employs migrant workers to sew school uniforms. We've asked him to film his home for us. Before his six workers left, they all lived in two rooms alongside Akram's family of eight. Now, with no work and no income, Akram says they'll soon have to rely on donations of food. The government has already handed out more than 600 million food parcels and it's announced a rescue package worth $400 billion. Even so, much of the job of looking after the poor is still falling to charities, like the one run by Vinod Shetty. Here he is with the children in Dharavi shortly before the shutdown was enforced. The people do not have access to water, clean toilets, hygiene. Water itself is, is a premium. You, you have to pay to get a few gallons of water and uh, toilets. Uh, the average use of a toilet seat is 80 people. 
So you're 80. talking of 80, 80. So with people all locked down in the slum, the numbers will increase. So all the safe distancing, the physical distance, the sanitation, the washing of hands, all these are very difficult things to implement in a slum. मेरा नाम संजीव साह है और ये मेरी मिसिस है चांदनी देवी बड़ी लड़की साढ़े पांच साल की है ढाई साल की लड़की है जानवी जो इधर खड़ी है संजीव शाह lives in a slum in Delhi. He was born in rural India but moved to the capital as a child with his mother after his father died and relatives seized their land. He works six days a week in a factory that makes steam irons, supporting his family on less than $10 a day. They all live in one tiny room. This is our kitchen. We have a cooler here at night. We sleep here in the house. We have a bathroom here. We go out and go out. We go out and go out and go out. The factory closed in the lockdown the factory closed in the lockdown and the family now survives on food donations. According to the World Health Organization, more than 280 million Indians live below the poverty line. That's more than one in five. Now, even more will go hungry. एक दिन दूध नहीं मिलता बच्चों के तो बहुत मम्मी बोलते बोलती मम्मा मुझे दूध चाहिए तो मैं कहाँ से लाके दूध मेरे हैं बहुत सपना था लड़की को पढ़ाओ लिखाओ मेरे से भी आगे पहुँचे मेरी लड़की लेकिन वो सपना पूरा नहीं हुआ जाइल बन गया हमारे बच्चे भी सरकार की हेल्प नहीं करने के कारण वो भी हमारे Acclaimed writer Arundhati Roy is spending lockdown at her home in Delhi not far from the many slums that dot the city. She's a long-time campaigner for the rights of India's dispossessed rural poor. Until about 15 years ago, India was a, a, a country where I would say something like 80% of the population lived in, in rural areas and was involved in agricultural activity. And there was a huge attack on village people, you know, in terms of huge infrastructure projects, dams, uh, building of highways, and millions of people were being displaced and driven into the city out of complete despair. People who had farmland around cities now turn it into sort of workers' quarters, and then they literally cram 10 workers into a room. They are, they are exploited, they are forced to buy rations from these landlords. They live in sort of Dickensian conditions. For Sanjeev and the millions of other Indians crammed into slums, getting ill from COVID-19 is a real concern. Twenty households share one tap, which often runs for just an hour a day. Delhi Sargar ko chitti bhi likhe diye yahan ke baare mein humne. Son Somdat yahan ka vidhaye ke usko bhi likhe diye humne. Pa usne bhi koi response nahi diya na udhar se response bhi aaya humare paas. Sochenge life achhi aayegi, aage life achhi aayegi. Sahar aage, sahar mein toh life bekar hai humari. 
Are you certain that you are, as a government, doing enough to reach those in need? In a country of 1.3 billion people, you will appreciate that there is... Not everyone can be taken care of, even with our best efforts. But uh, uh, the, the primary concern at that point was that uh, people should stay where they are. India will not be another Italy, comma, France or USA. Full stop. Bagadat has now clocked more than 60 days on the road. She's exposing the traumas India's most disadvantaged are living through. Okay. Uh, rolling. We came here after we heard that a migrant worker has taken his own life, that the economic hardship proved too much for him to take. And we have here his family, and you have here his wife, his four children, and his in-laws, his father-in-law and his mother-in-law. These children's father, Mukesh Mandal, lost his house painting job in the city before the lockdown. With no prospect of income during the pandemic, he sold his mobile phone for 2,500 rupees, the equivalent of 50 Australian dollars. He made it back to his village and a short time later, his wife found him dead. So why did you buy the phone? I was dying for eating, all of the kids were dying. There's a part of me as a reporter who feels terrible coming to talk to a family in this moment of their loss. And there's another part of me that feels that if I didn't do it, if we didn't invade their grief, as it were, at this moment, perhaps this family and other families like them would never get help. It's pouring down here, and we can go back to the shelter of our homes and to the material comfort of our lives. But this family is not just battling corona, it is battling extreme economic hardship. The Indian government shut down the country fast when it saw what was happening to overburdened hospitals overseas. Even before the virus hit, the health system was already struggling. The country has among the world's highest rates of diabetes, heart disease, and tuberculosis. When they say the coronavirus is the great equaliser, that's simply not true. There is a disproportionate number of poor people uh, who are suffering. And one more thing, you know, when, when the government says stay at home to, uh, to Indians and says you're safe, that's for people like me, my class of people. But for 92 million Indian households uh, who actually stay in one room, one room tenements, stay at home can sometimes mean eight people to a room. Today, Barkadat is speaking to me from outside one of the country's biggest hospitals. This is one of the hospitals where normally a lot of our poorest patients come for medical treatment, uh, for everything from tuberculosis uh, to cancer to HIV treatment. But this hospital has now become a COVID-only facility. In fact, when we were here this morning, uh, we met this uh, gentleman who's driven uh, from outside the capital uh, to come and try and get some medical help here. He's an HIV-positive patient. He's been diagnosed with AIDS, and he came to collect some very important medicine. So what option does that gentleman have now for treatment? As we just saw, Emma, uh, the fact is that poor Indian patients are going hospital to hospital and still, in many cases, unable to get medical intervention. And this is a growing concern for the country now. As we battle the pandemic, what happens to the non-COVID poor patients of India? Outside of the main cities, it's even harder to find medical treatment. The south of India, in health system terms, resembles Thailand, and the north of India resembles Sierra Leone. So you're talking about vastly different capacities within a single country. Ramanan Lakshminarayan is an epidemiologist and health economist 
who splits his time between India and the United States. Tuberculosis, we know, is a particular challenge for India, killing something, I understand, like 1,300 people a day. How is the hospital system dealing with that demand alongside the challenges of COVID-19? So this has been a real challenge in India, which is that uh, outpatient uh, departments have been shut down and people requiring care for more routine things like tuberculosis, like cancer, you know, like other chronic diseases have often been turned away because of the nature of the lockdown, which has been extremely strict, uh, which makes sense from a COVID standpoint, it probably is exacerbating deaths from other causes. And this really is a tragedy because it's not as if these other diseases come to a halt just because COVID is around. They're all continuing. As far as the coronavirus threat goes, the situation in India is not yet as serious as experts feared it might be, with only 3,000 recorded deaths as of May the 18th. The country's relative youth could be a factor. 65% of the population is under 35 years of age. But without significantly more testing, the true rate of infection is impossible to know. How transparent is government being in terms of providing you with that essential information? Indeed, how cooperative are the hospitals being in terms of providing the data? Well, Emma, there is a daily press briefing that the federal government, the Modi government holds, where you have officials give you uh, the latest numbers of COVID infected and how many tests have been conducted. Uh, but beyond that, uh, the real stories are not stories that, as, as you know, uh, come from governments giving you those stories. You have to go out uh, and you really have to go out to find those stories, to ferret out information. If I had not been at the borders, I would never have met the workers who were walking hundreds of kilometres, uh, you know, in search of home, often without food. Bakadatta and her crew are now driving south from Delhi to reach another of India's COVID-19 hotspots. Yeah, the child walking over the stones, we must have that in the report. For more than 20 years, she's hosted a primetime TV talk show. Now she runs her own digital media company. So I may have mispronounced that name in the video. Or maybe you can't tell. You can't really tell. If you had mispronounced it, I would have caught it. Posts on her YouTube channel have been viewed 33 million times. Sixteen hours later, they finally arrive. The city of Indore was one of the first to shutter its shop fronts, barricade its town square. It's an area with a large Muslim community. With direct flights from Dubai, it's thought the outbreak in Indore may have come from there. So, Himan, hello, hello. Oh, my God. Yeah, incredible. And we were stopped every 100 metres. It was a complete struggle to get here. So we're on, like, two, two hours of sleep and no food. 30% of India's early coronavirus cases were blamed on a mass gathering in Delhi of one particular Islamic sect. Muslim communities across the country are now feeling afraid. So, Emma, let me just uh, tell you what he's actually saying. He's saying that in some, in some homes here in this predominantly Muslim neighbourhood, there is a fear of stigma and backlash among Muslims, uh, you know, and that's something we've, we've been showing is happening across cities of India. Uh, a very high number of Muslims uh, went to hospitals and were not able to be uh, treated. To the extent that you can gauge it in a lockdown, what's the mood like there in Indore? 
Oh, surreal, because, you know, where I'm standing, uh, it was a wholesale market. You couldn't find breathing space. Uh, this city has an all-night food bazaar. It was one of my favorite places to come to. And all of that just seems now from an alternative universe. And so much in our life and the world as we know it has changed. And you come to, you know, you come to all these cities that used to be throbbing with life and, and, and pulsating with people. And, and you suddenly have sort of, you know, just emptied out streets. You have a bluer sky, but... Uh, that's not enough compensation for no life on the streets. The Indian government is taking tentative steps to reopen its economy, even while the number of coronavirus cases is rising rapidly. Do you think the shutdown has been worth the cost to the Indian economy, not just in dollar terms, but in overall well-being of your uh, people, given the fact that there is there was general poor health among your population going into this pandemic. The lives versus livelihoods sort of equation is 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 a difficult one. It's also an ethical dilemma. Uh, Early in the crisis in, in the UK and even in India, people spoke about herd immunity being the only way to fight this. Now, it sounds nice when you're writing an op-ed and using terms like herd immunity. In a country of 1.3 billion people, it could have led to maybe a million deaths, maybe more. I can't even put a number to it. Migrant workers are still walking the long journey home eight weeks after they suddenly found themselves unemployed and penniless. Even though some public transport is now running again, these cement workers say they had no money for a ticket. Many of the migrant workers are telling Barkadat they don't plan to return to the cities. The lockdown may have slowed the spread of the virus, but it's also exposed some uncomfortable truths. Barker, what have been the lessons from this pandemic, do you think, for India? Well, I think, for me, what it's taught me is that even I didn't notice or I had become numb uh, to the class divide of my country, to the deep inequalities. And I think this is a reminder to us that if the lockdown has indeed worked, and I hope it has, and it seems to have, then a disproportionate amount of that price for keeping the country safe has been paid uh, by the poorest Indian citizens. And for that, I think we owe them. Instead, we have so many of our elites acting as if they are the problem. And this is what happens when you show things candidly without dressing them up. This is reality. You can't control what actually happens on the street. <laughs> 